Qué buena uh, está en México. <risa> So thanks, uh, Patrick, for being here. Uh, I want to start for everyone who doesn't know about Stripe and Stripe Atlas. Sure. What is it? Why are you working at? Right sure. Um, so uh, uh, I know that there are some Stripe users uh, here in the audience, but basically Stripe is an API for moving money around on the internet. And so if you're building some product, some service, some website or something like that, and you, you want to move money around, you want to charge your customers, maybe you want to pay out to other people, you have suppliers or vendors or contractors or something like that, Stripe is a programmatic way to do that. And so you can think of Stripe as being kind of like AWS, uh, but, but for, for money or for financial infrastructure. Uh, and then Stripe Atlas uh, is a service we launched in uh, February of this year. And basically, Stripe Atlas is a way to start a company uh, uh, in the US. We're, we're, we're starting with the US. And so no matter where you are, you can be an entrepreneur you know, here in Mexico, you can be in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, you can be anywhere in the world, and you can start a, a normal Delaware US company, you can get a US bank account, uh, and get US tax and legal advice. And so basically, even if you're living in somewhere like Egypt, you can, you can compete, you can exist on a level playing field with other US companies. And so what we saw with, with Stripe as we traveled around the world uh, was that there were so many entrepreneurs with really good ideas in basically every single country, but often they had legal problems or logistical problems in getting started. And so Atlas is a, uh, a new way to do that and to, to start using Stripe and to start building their companies. Perfect. Actually, you're from Ireland, and this is started as a company to do payments, and you guys launch in Argentina. Can you tell me a little bit about that? That's there's, right. There's a tweet that I have. I'm not sure if you can, if you can project it when you're with your brother, uh, and oh. you guys are launching from a small coffee shop in Buenos Aires. What uh, are you doing in Buenos Aires? What happened there? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so John and I, were, we were in school uh, uh, in the U.S. We were in, in college oh. there, and we... Um, we, we wanted to go somewhere for a couple of weeks uh, to work on the first version of Stripe. Uh, and so we, were, we, we sort of had um, you know, two criteria. We're in college in Boston. And I don't know if you, uh, you've, you guys have been to Boston or if you've been there in the winter, but Boston in the winter is terrible. You, you really don't want to go there. Uh, and so we wanted somewhere with, with good weather. Uh, and we wanted somewhere with um, sort of a, a, a programmer's culture, uh, somewhere with places open late. Um, you know, where we could go get dinner at midnight or something like that. Uh, and we'd heard such great things about Buenos Aires. We, uh, neither of us had been to Latin America. Uh, and so we, we went to Buenos Aires to work on the first version of Stripe uh, for a month. Uh, and so the first Stripe customer uh, launched, um, I think it was January 7th or something like that, of, uh, of 2010. And yes, we were in a cafe in Buenos Aires. Nice. By the way, there are tacos 24-7 here. Just FYI. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think many countries uh, in Latin America would have worked well for us. We just knew we needed to get out of Boston. There are two co-founders uh, right now in Stripe, and you guys are brothers. That's right. Uh, you're the oldest ones, right? Uh, yes. Can you tell me about the relationship? How do two brothers start a company? Uh, what are the challenges? How, how is it? Should I start a company with my brother? Would you recommend it? <laughs> Yeah, I'll have to uh, have a, a liability disclaimer uh, with this answer. But, um, you know, John, my, my brother, he, he's, he's a modest guy. And so he, luckily he's not here, and so I can kind of say whatever I want about him. Um, but uh, he, uh, he, he's pretty smart. Um, uh, he's very smart. And, um, uh, you know, in, initially when, uh, you know, I've been programming for a long time, and I was thinking about starting a company, uh, I thought about starting it with people I was in college with and, and things like that. Uh, and then I realized, wait, why would I start a company with all these like randos in college who I haven't known for very long when you know, John's as smart or smarter than they are um, and, and I've known him for, I mean, all, basically all of my life. Uh, and so I started the company together. Um, you know, I think that w when you look at other companies that, that are successful, right? I mean, it's kind of obvious for the companies that are not successful, often there's disagreements between the co-founders and things don't work out and, and things like that. But when you look at the successful companies, it's still often the case that uh, there's disagreements and falling 
outs between the, the, the co-founders, and, and you know, just think things, it, it doesn't remain uh, uh, kind of closely knit. I think in the successful companies, people underestimate just how hard it's going to be, right? Again, in the, in the companies that don't work out, you know it's going to be hard. But even in the successful companies, you have problems constantly. And so whether it's your brother or somebody else or your sister, family member, longtime friend, whatever, uh, I think that starting a company with some you know, with somebody with whom you have like a, a really kind of extensive, uh, lengthy relationship. Basically someone who you can tell, you know, oh, you're full of shit, or that's a really bad idea, or I can't believe you just did that, or you, know, you can be really direct, really transparent, but also, you know, in that way to kind of avoid maybe small things becoming really big things and, and some uh, eventual falling out. Uh, and so, you know, I, I often say with regard to John that, you know, we, we had, um, at the time we started Stripe, we had basically 20 years of experience of resolving disagreements uh, uh, with each other. And you know, in many of those years, our strategy for resolving the disagreement, it wasn't that sophisticated. It you know, occasionally involved you know, our, our fists, but um, uh, we had lo lo lots of experience, and we were getting somewhat better at it over time. And so I think that foundation uh, was very helpful for Stripe. When there's a disagreement, is it resolved by the board or your parents? <laughs> Um, we, we, we fortunately haven't uh, had a, uh, a disagreement that's had to go to those two committees yet. Um, and uh, both Mike Moritz, who's Stripe's external board member, and our parents are pretty fearsome, and so I, I hope they never have to disagree. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so in Platzi, we're teaching a lot of people to code, and I know that your background comes from there. You were programming. You were not building a company at first. You were building an API to do payments. Right. Uh, any advice that you can give us uh, if we want to learn to code, if we want to be part of this ecosystem and be really great programmers? You actually started with Lisp programming. Can you tell me a little bit about your, your story, yeah. the languages that, that you use? Sure. Uh, so um, you know, there are probably lots of things in my particular programming experience that uh, might be a, a bad idea to, to replicate. Um, but uh, the, the, the high-level piece of advice I'd give to everyone, and I'm sure this is something that, uh, I know it's something that uh, C Christian often advocates, is to build real things. Uh, don't just do exercises, uh, don't just build toys, but actually build real things that ideally your friends can use. Because uh, you know, your, your friends are going to give you sort of real feedback. They're not going to spare your feelings. And maybe for the first thing you build, they'll say, oh, that's nice. But then sort of pretty soon after that, they'll be, well, that's not very good. I don't really want to use it. Uh, and so it, it's, it, it forces you to, to start sort of really understanding users and understanding what kind of the, the right way to solve problems is. For, for me in particular, I actually I started out, my first programming language was PHP. Um, and uh, I learned that when I was uh, kind of early in my teens. Uh, and then took this like weird path. So I, you know, I grew up in Ireland. We were very rural Ireland. Kind of, you know, our, our house was surrounded by farms. And so there really wasn't a whole lot kind of else to do. And so I started learning Lisp and, uh, and Smalltalk and Haskell and, and you know, all these other kind of weird, weird languages. Um, but you know, it at least gave a useful kind of breadth of perspective. But honestly, the, the thing that I think now that I look back and say, looking back from, uh, again, when we started Stripe, the thing that was most useful was not having spent lots of time with all these different programming languages. Uh, it was building, just trying to build lots of different real things that other people used. And so that's the thing I'd really emphasize. Just build, if you build 10 things, that at least 10 people use, like you're probably really well positioned to then go and create something really successful. Thanks. Uh, Patrick, let's talk about entrepreneurship. Uh, there's a lot of people here that want to build their own companies. There's a lot of founders, and they're coming from all over Latin America, specifically Mexico uh, here. Uh, you're also a foreign in Silicon Valley. You were not born there, you got there. Yep. Uh, what were the biggest challenges as a foreign, and what advice could you give to Mexicans that actually want to start a company in Silicon Valley, like we're doing right now? Right. Um, you know, I think the question of, uh, of whether you should go to Silicon Valley, uh, it really depends on what you're building. Um, and I think that for some companies, uh, and I think Stripe was one of them, it really makes sense to be in Silicon Valley, right? Because Stripe's customers are other entrepreneurs, other developers, and obviously entrepreneurs and developers are kind of everywhere in the world, uh, but the, the greatest concentration of them at the moment is in Silicon Valley, and so it, it made sense for us. But I think that increasingly, as sort of, um, as 
entrepreneurs and as technology companies are serving kind of broader markets. If you think of all of the, the, the new you know, logistics companies that are now starting, all the mobile apps for delivery and ride sharing and, and sort of services like that, um, in those cases, I think it's more important to be, again, close to your customers, to be in the market. And so if you're starting a company doing, for example, deliveries uh, uh, here in Mexico, uh, you know, or your, your ride sharing or you know, s s something like this, uh, then I think you should certainly stay here um, uh, because th that's where you're going to get the best feedback on your product. That's where you're going to get the most experience with it. And then if you're building maybe a software product where your customers are other software companies, then I think there's potentially uh, a good argument for, for going to, to Silicon Valley or you know, may, maybe one of the other startup hubs or something like that, right? Um, you know, as, as well as kind of difficult for us, you know, I, I, I think we were fortunate uh, in that uh, Silicon Valley, as is, is, I'm sure most people here know, is, is very accepting of, of immigrants and a, you know, a large fraction of the people who've been most successful in Silicon Valley have themselves been immigrants, right? And so people in Silicon Valley are, you know, they're, they're used to it. And so the barriers from, from people in Silicon Valley, they're, they're not that high. They're, they're quite accepting. There are definitely a lot of challenges with uh, the U.S. immigration system, which uh, imposes, in my opinion, all sorts of insane restrictions uh, on the ability for entrepreneurs or just people in general who want to do valuable things uh, to come to the U.S., uh, but I would say kind of the, the challenges that we encountered, they were more kind of at the, the U.S. level um, uh, rather than at the Silicon Valley level. Once you get to Silicon Valley, then uh, th things actually, uh, again, the, the ecosystem is, is really quite favorably uh, oriented. You mentioned at first uh, Stripe Atlas, and with Stripe Atlas, you're actually giving uh, an option for everyone to do business in the U.S. Yes. without being there. Yes. But what's the big dream uh, for, for people who actually want to incorporate, that want to use uh, Atlas? Can you tell us what's coming, what's happening, what's, what's the big dream after uh, sure. behind uh, Stripe Atlas? Yeah, well, it, you know, it, it kind of, um, uh, that, that, that follows nicely from your last question. So with Atlas, uh, you know, uh, a large fraction of the people at Stripe uh, uh, are, not, you know, are not working in the country in which they were born. About a third of the people at Stripe, last time we counted, uh, are, are, are immigrants. They're, they're, they're working in some other country, right? And, so, and you know, the, the people themselves, they're from everywhere from you know, Honduras, Sweden, uh, Kenya, like a, a really broad variety of places. And as, as, we, tra as we travel the world, the, the, the thing that we saw kind of firsthand was there were people in basically every single country who had ideas about starting companies, who in many cases had built prototypes or had something up and running, but again, they were being held back by legal problems, payments problems, banking problems, you know, th things of this sort. And many of them were wondering, well, okay, do I have to move to Silicon Valley to solve this problem? And we thought that in, me, in a lot of those cases, moving to Silicon Valley, that, that might solve the legal problem, it might solve the banking problem, but it may, it may make something else worse, right? Because now you're further, again, from your customers. Or maybe you don't want to leave your, the country you're, you're living in, right? I mean, your, your family is here, your employees are here, your friends are here, you, you, you want to help the development of the country, whatever. And so what we wondered was, is there a way to, kind of, to bridge this, to give you the legal advantages of being in the US while still you know, operating uh, in, in, in your home country, right? And so that's the basic kind of thesis behind Atlas, that we can enable these people kind of much more effectively uh, than they have been in the past, and that uh, uh, you know, we, they, we can sort of sustainably help them remain operating in sort of you know, the country they want to be in. And so that's the idea. Again, we, we, we launched in February, uh, and uh, you know, the, the, I guess the main thing that we've now seen is that like, this, this idea, this bet, it turns out to be true. Uh, with Atlas, we've had people apply from basically every country in the world. Like there are technology entrepreneurs in, who, who want to pursue one of these ideas uh, in, in, in basically every single country. And so now our focus is on sort of you know, just accelerating this and enabling it as, as effectively as we can, right? Atlas is still, you have to apply for an invite because just there are so many people who are sort of scrambling as quickly as we can to keep up with it. And then the other thing we're thinking about is uh, expanding outside of the US. And so currently we give you a bank account and a company and so on in the US. But over time, we want to go broader than that because, you know, depending on where you are in the world, maybe it makes sense to be incorporated, you know, somewhere else. It's not sort of specifically a U.S. thing. The, the, the core idea is just making sure that legal barriers, finance barriers, banking barriers, things like this, that they don't get in the way. 
By the way, here in Mexico and also in Chile, there's laws that are uh, pushing forward for companies to be open in one day. So in the future, you, you might want to consider those, those as options. Uh, absolutely. We want to be basically wherever entrepreneurs themselves would like to be incorporated. And so we, we really listen to, you know, to, to, to what people on the ground say, because that, you know we're we are developers building for other entrepreneurs and developers, and so you know we uh, I, I often sort of describe how like figuring out our roadmap uh, and strategy it's not that complicated. We just listen to developers and entrepreneurs and do what they say. Final question about Atlas: What's the biggest surprise that you've seen after running this uh, product for a couple of a couple of months, actually, right? That's right. Um, you know, I, I guess it's now well, it's now October, so. Uh, uh, call it you know, uh, uh, approximately eight months. Um, the biggest surprise, um, I mean, the, the easy answer is just how large the demand was, right? Uh, in that you know, we, uh, we, we, we knew that some people wanted us because we talked to folks. I mean, we, we talked to you and we, we discussed it back uh, uh, before we launched this. But we did not imagine that there would be entrepreneurs in, again, almost literally every single country uh, who wanted to, to use something like this. And in terms of other surprises, um, you know, but, but this also goes for Stripe itself. Um, but, uh, you know, the, uh, well, and actually, sorry, on the previous one, just to give a sense, we've, we've had the first uh, Atlas company go live in the Gaza Strip. Right? Uh, there, are, there are entrepreneurs who want to build technology companies even in sort of the, the, the places where there are the, the most structural barriers and legal impediments and the, you know, the most, most challenging circumstances. And so that's been really surprising. Um, and then, and this one applies to Stripe itself, just the, the breadth of ideas. Like some of the things you can maybe, you can predict or you know, aren't too surprising. You're like, well, obviously there's going to be you know, delivery services and taxi services, ride sharing, whatever. Just, you know, you know that people want things like this. But then we keep coming across ideas where we're like, huh, you know, we never would have thought that that, that, that was a company. And I, I think it's, it's always easy to underestimate creativity because, I mean, new ideas are kind of by definition something that people haven't thought of before. Uh, and so you know, just how many new ideas we never considered, you know, it, that's, a, that's always a fun surprise. And talking also about the local product, because you guys are, you have Stripe for the US, you have Stripe for many countries. Right. Actually, from the Spanish-speaking countries, Mexico and Spain are in your list yes. as their closed betas. Correct. Can you tell me a little bit about how they're working? Sure. How can people apply? They want to yes. they they play with the tool? How, how would it work? Yeah, good question. Uh, and so this kind of... We work in two ways, right? Uh, the, the sort of the, the main Stripe model is we go and we work directly with banks in the countries in which we operate and go and sort of get all the, the local infrastructure up and running uh, to make sure that we can really effectively serve the, the domestic market. And then Atlas is kind of an, al an alternative where for some companies, for their own reasons, they actually want to incorporate elsewhere. But of course, many companies, in fact, probably most companies, want to be legally resident uh, in, in their domestic market, right? And so uh, we, we work with, again, local financial institutions to support that. And so uh, we've been in, uh, in uh, beta in Mexico now for you know, quite a number of months. And in fact, I, I, I was checking this morning our, our beta in Mexico. It's actually it's one of the fastest growing uh, Stripe markets. If you just look at the month over month growth rate, it's in the top 10. Uh, and so it, it, there's really a huge amount of, uh, of demand here. Um, you, know, you asked, how do you get an invite to the beta? Well, probably the best answer is to, to email me. And so uh, my email address is patrick at stripe.com. And so if you want an invite to the beta, just send me an email and you know, I'll, I'll uh, um, uh, make sure that you receive one. Um, uh, and similarly in Spain, uh, uh, also in beta. Um, the reason we start out with these betas is because we really want to make sure that we've figured out you know, all of the local issues and you know, the surprising things that might crop up and so forth. Like the, kind of the, the Stripe promise uh, is that uh, we, we build all this really robust financial infrastructure. We understand you know, all the weird things that can happen. We've debugged you know, all of the problems and so forth. And so when we come into a market for the first time, well, you know, we're new. We don't, we don't know uh, what we don't know. And so uh, we, we want to you know, run things uh, for a while, make sure we really understand it. And then when we're confident that we uh, can offer sort of a really battle-tested product, then we go and launch it publicly. Uh, and so again, uh, Patrick at Stripe.com, uh, if you would like an invite. And actually, in order to also understand these markets, how you're building your team helps you. 
uh, there's people from Mexico working at Stripe. Yes. Uh, Eduardo, Jorge, you have yep. someone from Honduras. That's Can right. you tell me a little bit about the stories of this Mexican uh, programmers, developers, uh, just tech people that are working at Stripe? Sure. A little bit about their stories? Yeah, you know, I mean, th their stories, I mean, again, there's, there's a lot of um, you know, people in, in really uh, kind of impactful roles at Stripe from Mexico or from other parts of Latin America. Uh, Jorge, who you just mentioned, he grew up in Monterrey, um, and uh, he, he's an engineering manager at Stripe. He has managed various parts of Stripe's infrastructure, like the core systems uh, for processing the payments, um, or Billy, uh, who heads up all of our financial partnerships uh, uh, and other partnerships on a global basis. Uh, uh, he grew up in, uh, in Honduras. Uh, or Eduardo, who's currently working with a bunch of the companies that use Stripe for subscriptions and so forth. So, uh, but you know, their stories are really just um, uh, kind of you know, instances of the, of the broader set of immigrants uh, uh, working at Stripe, or you know, again, people living outside of the country in which they were born. And generally speaking, I guess, Stripe just really believes in sort of, uh, in, on some level, globalization um, and sort of the, the belief that sort of skill and talent and ambition and the desire to work hard and, and all these things are sort of evenly distributed around the world. And so if we're you know, only hiring Americans, like the vast majority of, of, of you know, skilled people, people who could really make an impact on Stripe uh, are, are, are being left out. And so we really, again, in as much as we can uh, within the, the limitations imposed by the U.S. immigration system, um, uh, we, we really like hiring folks from, from you know, these sorts of backgrounds. Uh, and certainly, you know, if there's ever you know, any of you in the audience you're, you're interested in uh, sort of you know, talking to us, I, I really encourage you to apply. And we're, we're very willing to, you know, go to try to figure out ways, of, uh, if possible, to, to go get visas for people and so on. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, you know, Jorge and, and, and Billy and so forth, uh, they actually studied in the US, which is obviously uh, sort of a, a fairly kind of common pattern for, for you know, f folks from all around the world sort of first come to the US, including me. Um, but I hope that over time we can do a better job of sort of uh, uh, you know, taking people who are later in their careers and making them really successful at Stripe. So you can apply to Stripe, but what kind of technologies are you using right now? If someone is interested, it's like, oh, I like your product, I want a program for Stripe. Yep. What skills are you looking for right now? Yeah, well, um, you know, uh, we really look for people who are motivated by the problems we're solving rather than the specific technologies, right? Because we might change technology in the morning or, you know, it'll probably take us more than a day to make a change, right? But sort of the, the particular technologies aren't set in stone. And so we look for people who are really motivated to work with other entrepreneurs, with developers, to, to build tools for developers. You know, we're, um, uh, there are a lot of consumer products in the world. Uh, most companies in Silicon Valley, at least the ones you, you heard of uh, uh, and that sort of tend to get the most attention in the media, they tend to be consumer companies, right? And, and Stripe is not a consumer company. Uh, we, we sometimes use the analogy that sort of there are lots of companies uh, building cars, uh, but we're a company building roads, right? And so that's kind of a particular mindset, sort of people who like building tools and like building, again, for other entrepreneurs and developers. And so if that's what's interesting to you, then, again, uh, the, you, know, you, you, you should... So, so, certainly, uh, uh, you know, go and uh, check out our jobs page. In terms of the specific technologies that we use, uh, we use a lot of Ruby. Uh, we use you know, some amount of Go. We obviously use plenty of JavaScript and you know, Swift on mobile and, and, and so forth. Um, we care a lot about sort of figuring out ways to kind of do, do two things in parallel, to both build you know, the, the best, the most interesting, the most flexible, the most powerful, the most composable developer tools and then to operate them incredibly reliably at, at enormous scale, right? And so it, there, there are lots of companies that sort of you know, build, I mean, there are lots of open source projects that just build developer tools, right? But they don't have to operate them. And there are lots of services that operate at an enormous scale, but they're generally, or in most cases, you know, they're, they're not that innovative. They don't change that much because they're at such huge scale, it's hard to change them. And so kind of the core problem for Stripe is how do we be the, the leader in terms of building the most powerful developer tools while also, again, you know, offering it to hundreds of thousands of businesses all around the world and making sure it's insanely reliable because, you know, it's people running their businesses on Stripe. Uh, talking about Mexico, and just to close this part, you told me that it's growing fast. 
How about companies? Companies that are working with Stripe, any examples that you can mention? So, so you know that there's, uh, there's, there's some brands around here who are also using your product and doing payments here yes. in Mexico City. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, I, I, I wish I could give the whole list. Um, uh, you know, some that I think are you know, particularly interesting or, or sort of quite impressive. You know, I met the Yaxi folks uh, last night for the first time in person, which was great. There's also you know, City Drive and, and Carrot. Um, Corner Shop is obviously doing really well. Uh, I really like Bright. Um, they're selling solar panels um, and, and sort of really innovating on the energy front uh, uh, here in the country. Um, but really, we've been shocked at how, I mean, I guess, again, we, we knew that there'd be, uh, almost in every market, there, there's kind of some basic needs that, that, that need to be serviced. But what's really kind of interesting and compelling to see is uh, that you know, there, there, there are companies based in Mexico Ser serving audiences far beyond Mexico and that really have these, these global ambitions. And actually, again, last night I met with the folks from Beak. Uh, uh, I presume uh, uh, many people here in the audience know it. Uh, if not, you should check out uh, beak.io. Um, but I think that's a nice example of a company that really has you know, no limitation on, on sort of you know, how broadly it can be made available over time. And so uh, you know, th 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 those are some of the top of mind examples. Great. So at the end, you are building infrastructure, you're building roads, but you are connecting businesses with money. So you're basically building infrastructure for the future of money and payments. What's, what have you discovered? Anything that you want to share about what's, what's the future going to like? How are we going to be doing payments? Are we going to follow the steps that China uh, is currently doing? Right. What have you seen? What can you predict for Latin America? I know it's, it's hard, but what can you share? Yeah, man, I'm, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that question. Um, you know, I suppose the thing that we believe at Stripe uh, is that there isn't really going to be um, an answer to kind of payments in Latin America and an answer to payments in the US and payments in Europe and so on. Uh, why we're so optimistic about it and so interested in the internet is because of the new kind of sort of connectivity that it enables. And again, this, this idea of, of globalization. I mean, we're, we're just really optimistic about sort of this, this new ecosystem that now exists and that sort of that makes geography less important. And I think sort of the, I mean, the history of you know, human civilization is that sort of as you get larger markets, uh, you, can have, you can have more specialization. You can have people sort of advancing all these you know, different narrow parts and really going deep, making breakthroughs, understanding new things that's possible and supported because you have, you know, ever, ever larger customer bases. And so you go from a city to a country to now with the internet, the whole world. And so when we think about the future, we think about it sort of in those terms of it's not kind of how do we enable companies in Mexico to, to, to you know, sell more effectively to people in Mexico. I mean, of course, we want to do that, but that's not enough. It's how do we enable entrepreneurs and developers and people in Mexico to sell really effectively to the whole world and to have this kind of this intermingling, this kind of, these new combinations of businesses. So there's kind of a, a, a company in Kenya building something that's used by a company in Mexico that's then in turn used by a company in Estonia that's you know, being built on by, I don't know, some people in Ireland or something, right? And, and so that's kind of the, the way we think about it. And then from a, a payments infrastructure standpoint, uh, what we kind of consequently care a lot about is, is the universality and, and the ubiquity. Like, we, you know, when we think about supporting, um, you know, uh, payment mechanisms in a particular country, uh, you know, we don't just want to make it possible for Mexican companies to support those payment mechanisms. We want to make it possible for companies in, in Australia to support those payment mechanisms. When we, uh, when we uh, added support for Alipay uh, in, in, in China, you know, we, we didn't want to enable or just enable sort of Chinese businesses to support Alipay. We wanted businesses here in Mexico to be able to accept Alipay. And so, again, when we, when we think about the future, it's with that kind of um, universal lens. And the final question, any piece of advice from your professional life that you want to share with our Latin American students? Hmm. You know, um, I, I, I can't remember who sort of first said the line that uh, you know, advice is just kind of particular personal experience that's kind of over extrapolated and over generalized, right? And so, you know, uh, my, uh, a, single, a single piece of advice that was very important for you, a single piece of advice that was very important for you in your life that you want to share um, to close today. Well, the. Um, Maybe this is not an uplifting piece of advice, uh, and so um, 
I may have to think of two to, to finish on a more optimistic note. Uh, but uh, kind of returning to the point earlier, um, I, I think people should really go in kind of eyes wide open to thinking about startups and companies and so forth uh, about, of course, if the company doesn't work, it's going to be hard and you're going to be miserable and, and sad and there'll be, there'll be lots of problems. But even if the company works, uh, there are still going to be lots of problems and lots of things are going to break and lots of evenings you'll be sad and so forth. And so it's just, just be prepared for that and know that sort of if you're feeling that way or if stuff sucks or whatever, like that doesn't mean your company isn't a good idea or it's not going to work out or whatever. It's just no matter what happens, you're going to have like pretty significant challenges. So, so that's one, but again, that's made too pessimistic. Um, I, uh, um, you know, almost everything I think is, is solvable in a company. Like you can screw up almost anything. I mean, I know of people uh, who they incorporate their company in all sorts of weird ways. Like Facebook started out as a Florida company and they had to like go change that and fix it and turn it into a Delaware company. Um, or they make bad hiring decisions or they, they start out, you know, Anyway, something being substantially off, and they make some mistake along the way. Most of those things, not all of them, but most of them are fixable. And so, you know, I, you should fix them, but I wouldn't get too stressed out over most of them. The thing that's almost impossible to fix that you cannot surmount is not having a product that people really want to use. And so, if you are just to sort of to you know go to bed worrying about one particular thing, it's like, is this actually a thing that you know many other people are are going to want to use? Uh, and so. Um, you know, if you get that right, uh, again, the, maybe the optimistic uh, version of all these uh, challenges you're going to face is most of those other challenges are going to be fixable. Perfect. Freddy, you had one last yes. question. You were test, telling test. Me. Hello. Hello. Dola. There is a question from the internet. One of our students from the English-speaking side of Platzi, our platform in English, wants to know, how, how did you get your first customers for Stripe? Can you briefly tell us how that happened? Yes. Um, so, well, the, the short answer is uh, our, uh, our first customer was actually friends of ours. And actually, the, the second customer was also a friend. And the, I think the third and the fourth as well. And so because we we're, uh, again, building a product for other developers and for other entrepreneurs, I mean, a lot of our friends were also, of course, developers. Uh, and so we basically, um, you know, politely, repeatedly, and very repeatedly uh, asked them to, to, to go and integrate. And eventually, they were like, OK, fine, fine, fine. Um, and so th that's really where the first uh, ones came from. And actually, it's kind of a funny story, but um, the, uh, the, the, the first product oh, yeah. ever uh, sold on Stripe uh, was a product called Atlas. Um, uh, it was a completely different Atlas to our Atlas. And that, that product, it, it didn't end up uh, working out. and so that Atlas no longer exists, but it was called Atlas. Um, and so th 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 that was the, the first thing. I mean, I, I think that in general, uh, I mean, using your friends uh, for, for the first 10 customers uh, is, is a pretty effective way of doing things. Uh, they, they'll often give you more honest feedback, uh, kind of counterintuitively, uh, than people who are strangers. And that, you know, if you ask a stranger, you know, is this good or do you like it or whatever, you know, they'll want to be polite. They're like, yeah, this is kind of nice. Um, uh, because, you know, they don't care if they're sort of sending you off on the wrong path. Whereas your friend, I think, is more likely to be like, you know, Patrick, I love you, but this sucks. Um, uh, and so um, uh, I, I encourage for first 10 customers, uh, friends are good. Thanks, Patrick, uh, for coming to Mexico. He's on his way to Asia, so he just did a small stop here. Uh, give it up an applause for, for, for Patrick. Un aplauso para Patrick. Gracias.